Amen. Good morning, Freedom Church. For, uh, friends and visitors, just want to say thanks for being here, uh, especially if this is your first time with us. Uh, we just want to say welcome to you. My name's Clint. I'm the lead pastor, one of the elders, um, one of the guys that leads the church. Uh, but we are delighted you're here. Uh, we especially want to be sensitive to those who maybe uh, you're exploring the Christian faith. Uh, you're not sure what you believe, but you've decided to explore Christ. Uh, and so we just want to say thank you for coming. I want you to know this is a safe place for you to do that. We want this to be a place where non-Christians uh, can, can gather and come and hear the gospel and wrestle with the implications of the gospel and know that they can have good interactions and conversations with other Christians. So we want you to know this is a good place for you to be, uh, and we're glad you're here. Um, if you've got your Bible, flip to Matthew 23. Uh, you'll need your Bible today more than, than typical. We're going to cover a huge portion of Scripture. Um, and so I've just got an outline that'll be on the PowerPoints. Um, and so I won't actually, the verses themselves won't be up there. So uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, we've got some at the back, at the back table. Um, yes, just back there now. We only have one table. That's awesome. I forgot. Um, so at the back table, if you want a Bible, feel free to grab one of those. Um, and I also need to warn you if you're a visitor and if, you're, if this is your first time, uh, you need to know you picked an interesting Sunday for this to be your first time. So if, uh, if you're new, typically we preach right through books of the Bible. Uh, we believe that God has spoken in His Word. Uh, the Holy Spirit has inspired and written books of the Bible for a reason. Uh, there's a logic, there's a, there's a train of thought that goes th throughout an entire book, and that book fits an entire uh, meta narrative of Scripture that all centers on the person and work of Christ. And so we just walk through books, typically. Every now and then we'll do topical things, but typically walk through books. And so if, if two weeks ago when I preached, the sermon title was King of the Mic Drop, uh, where we talked about Jesus dropping the mic on people uh, with these great statements. Um, at some level, I was just joking with somebody, this could be king of the like, mic spike. Um, so, I mean, he, he's going to slam down some very difficult sayings in this text. And so, again, if you're a visitor, uh, know that we're going to follow the scriptures and we're going to walk right through the text. And where the text is intense, we will be intense. And so, just a fair warning this morning, the text is very uh, intense. It's, it's very... Um, poignant. It, Christ gets at and goes after a few things. Uh, and so I just want to pray kind of in that spirit uh, for us to jump in uh, as, as we get into the text. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've been kind enough by your Holy Spirit to inspire and carry along men uh, to write your word to us so that we don't have to wonder what it might be like, uh, what, for you, what you think or what you love, what you hate. God, you've spoken to us in your word. So we're thankful for your word. So we say to you, thanks be to God, after we hear your word, because we're thankful that you are God who speaks and you've spoken uh, perfectly and finally in Christ Jesus the Lord, and you've revealed Christ Jesus the Lord in the written text of Scripture. And so we just pray now, would you bless our time in the word, help us to focus in on you, hear from you, and respond to you in repentance and faith. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So as a, as a pastor, every week I'm seeking and I'm imagining that I'm speaking to at least three different people every week as I, as I proclaim the text of Scripture. First would be the Christian who needs to be instructed and built up in the gospel. So I'm assuming most of you, the majority of you are Christians who have turned from your sin, you've repented of sin, you've trusted in Christ, you've received His grace and mercy and forgiveness, and now you need to grow in Christ. And as we say, Christians tend to be leaky. Uh, we tend to leak Monday through Saturday of the gospel and belief and hope in the gospel. So we gather together to be encouraged and edified and built up in the gospel through His Word. So the first group, again, I would imagine I'm speaking to are Christians. But secondly, there would be non-Christians. As I mentioned, we're, we're always excited when non-Christians join us for worship to look into the things of Christ. And so the non-Christians here are needing to be introduced to the gospel mainly for the first, mainly or potentially for the first time. I got to speak to some college students out in San Diego as well, and, uh, and there was a, a young man from India uh, who kind of the first time he really began to wrestle with the gospel. And so I would assume there's Christians who need to be encouraged in the gospel. There are non-Christians who um, need to be introduced and hear the gospel in some ways for the first time or wrestle with it continually. But thirdly, and this group is the one that terrifies me the most, is the one who's deceived, thinks they're a Christian, but actually has no idea what the gospel is. So it's the person who believes that they're safe before God when really he's no Christian at all. And all throughout this gospel, as he's going through the book of Matthew, we've watched Jesus give these warnings, particularly when he talks to the Pharisees or the scribes or these religious leaders. We saw it in Matthew chapter 7 when he said, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, Depart from you, evildoers, I never knew you. So Jesus says, On judgment day many will say, Didn't I do all these good things? And he will respond, I never knew you. That's a terrifying passage of scripture. And it's been a terrifying reality as we've gone through the book of Matthew to see these warnings that we can deceive ourselves. 
And in that, what has what Christ consistently throughout this book gone after? What is it in the Pharisees that he's gone after? It's this outward religious thing on the outside, but a wickedness on the inside. So we've seen Jesus contrast the difference between pharisaical worship and then authentic worship. And so the phar- pharisaical worship works from the outside in. So this is, this is what's wrong with religious people that don't understand the gospel. They work from the outside in. So they're characterized by, by behavior conforming and sin management. So it's like you need to act this particular way and you need to get your sins under control. So manage your sin and conform to these particular behaviors. Start on the outside and work your way in. And the main focus of Pharisaical religion is outward appearance of godliness to others. The Pharisee is really only concerned about, main focus is what other people think about me. Do they think I'm religious? That's all that matters. And this is what Jesus has gone after. Whereas authentic worship, is, it works from the inside out. So it's when the, the, the good news of the gospel penetrates the person's heart and begins to transform the heart such that then their life transforms on the outside. So again, false worship works from the outside in. True worship goes from the inside out. It's characterized by heart transforming and sin slaying. So the one, again, f- false worship is just sin management. Let's get my sins under control. True worship is the gospel penetrates your heart and you murder your sin. You put it to death. Jesus says things throughout the Gospel of Matthew like pluck out your eye if that's what it takes. So we put to death the deeds in, of the flesh, as Paul says in Romans 8, 13. This is what it looks like. The main focus uh, for the, the heart that's transformed from the inside out as the Westminster Confession grabs a, the, the, the um, purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So the person who's gripped in his heart by the Gospel says, I want to glorify God and enjoy Him. The person who's a phony says, I just want them to think I'm doing that. And so this is what Jesus has gone after all throughout this book. And this is why our text today is so intense. R.T. France, one commentator, captures it well. It shows Jesus as a fierce controversialist, quite willing to make enemies when the cause demanded it. And the cause was important for what was at issue was the contrast between the values of the kingdom of heaven and the superficial approach of religion. Jesus goes after the Pharisaic system in total. In this text, he's going to go after the whole system and he's going to warn his disciples of and then rebuke the Jewish leaders for being hypocritical false teachers. So that's why it's going to be so intense because he's going after you're a hypocritical false teacher. And so we're going to see the text at the beginning. He's going to warn his disciples look, this is how you know you're hearing from a hypocritical false teacher. So let me give you kind of four marks. And then he's actually going to speak to those hypocritical false teachers with great inten- intensity uh, in those which we've been called the seven woes. Uh, of Christ to, the, to them. So the main thought that I want us to, to go into the text uh, today, main thought, one can appear outwardly righteous to others while being wicked before God. Therefore, all should rest in the mercy of Christ. One can appear outwardly righteous to others all the while being wickedly in their, in wicked in their hearts. So that's why the call for all of us is to rest in the mercy of Christ. So again, Jesus jumps in, or this text, Matthew jumps in, First point, how to spot a hypocritical false teacher. He begins with these four marks. How do do I know if I'm sitting under somebody who's teaching wrongly, who's hypocritical, who's false? Four marks. First mark, they have positions of authority that should be honored. So look at verse 1 through 3. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but do not do the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. So the first mark before you can understand how to repre- or, uh, recognize a false teacher is to understand he has a position of authority. So Jesus begins by saying, these scribes, these Pharisees, they sit on Moses' seat. Now what does that mean? It means they are the ones who are in charge of teaching the law of Moses to the people of God. So they have a position of authority that should be honored. There's a right way to honor. We'll talk about it a little bit more later. There's a, there's a right kind of honors that should come to those in positions of authority. We see this all throughout the scriptures. And so first, when we begin to recognize, the first thing you need to realize is th- like to recognize a false teacher, you, you're going to see somebody in a position of authority. What does this mean? It means at some level, they're qualified in some way, shape, or form to be in that seat, right? Probably gifted. They're probably a good teacher. They're probably educated. They're probably sharp. So they've, they've done some things on the outside that would make them appear to be worthy to sit or be in that position, just like these scribes and Pharisees. They're on the, the chair of Moses. They have a place of position. This is what makes it so dangerous because they have positions that would lead one to assume that they're trustworthy. 
And so this is why Christ is going to start off with, look, they're in, the, they're in the right chair. And they're reading and teaching from the right law, namely the law of Moses. And this is the great danger that we can just assume the position itself means the person is trustworthy. However, we must be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 10. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. As Christians, we must all, as we sit under the word preached, be listening and examining the scriptures to make sure what we're hearing taught lines up with the text. So just because I say it doesn't equal it's right. As Christians, we're all to be active listeners sitting under the word, listening to the preached word. Like, hold up, let me see if that's what that says. So we're not passive. We don't just sit there like, ah, the pastor will tell us what the Bible says. No, as Christians, we want to feed on God's word. And so we trust the pastor to instruct us and teach us his word. But we, we measure up that teaching with the text itself. So we're going to be active listeners. I was deeply encouraged from one of the, um, Josh mentioned, getting to do chapel for the Chargers, which was like a bucket list, fun, awesome thing because I love football. But I was super encouraged because I, I did it on Sunday night. But then Monday, I worked in the hotel for a little bit. And one of them came by and we, we got to talking a little bit. <clears throat> and he said to me, he said, I recorded the whole thing last night. I'm about to go listen to it again and, and take notes on it. That's what I do every week. So encouraged by that. Why? Because he's, exam- he's listening and then he's examining the text. Is this what the text actually says? This is how all Christians should live. Not like super Christians. Not like Johnny super Christian got it all together Christians. This is just basic Christians. We examine the scriptures to make sure what we're hearing is true. So again, the first, the first mark of a false teacher is that he has a right position of authority that should be honored. And so that's the reason we must be engaged and listen actively. Secondly, observation about a false teacher. They wear their people out. Look at verse 4. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. So it says, look, they, these teachers, these false guys will lay burdens on their people that they're not willing to move one finger to move. So they're not going to help you carry these burdens. They're not even going to move a finger. They're not, like, not going to break a sweat. They're going to create these rules and, and regulations you need to follow that somehow they're exempt from following. They lay these burdens that weigh down. So the picture is literally like uh, on, on um, a cattle or something like a slave that would be carrying heavy burdens that's just weighing the body down. This is what Christ says. Peter surely has these words uh, of Jesus in mind when he argues with the Pharisees in Acts chapter 15. So there's a debate going on in Acts chapter 15. Do, do the Gentile converts now have to obey the rules and regulations of Moses? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to become Jewish? And Peter says in Acts chapter 15, verse 10, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? So again, this is the second mark. False teachers have these extra biblical rules that they heap like burdens upon the shoulders of their followers and it exhausts them. That's what it looked like to sit under a false teacher. You look exhausted, worn out, like you can never do enough. And so what it does is it creates a culture of people who are prideful legalists and then suddenly eventually become exhausted legalists who just want to give up altogether. So at first, you know, he starts heaping all these extra rules and the people that are doing the rules think, oh, look at me, I'm a good Christian. Look how good I am. Look at all the rules I obey. I don't do this, I don't do that. Y'all know the cheesy, awful phrase that is so characteristically true by some unhealthy situations in the church, right? Don't drink, don't cuss, don't chew, and don't go with women who do. Right? That's some churches, that's, that's all they say, essentially. Just don't do those things. And so then you get these arrogant, built-up, prideful people. Like, Look at me, I don't do that. At least I don't do that. I don't do that either. I'm a good Christian. But at some point, you begin to realize that's working from the outside in. That's conforming on the outside, but my heart's not transformed. And eventually, I get exhausted, and I just want to give up altogether. And so you go from this arrogant legalist to this exhausted legalist. This is what it looks like to sit under a false teacher. It just loads them up with burdens. <clears throat> but somehow, because of his lofty position, he makes it where he don't have to obey the rules. So somehow he's above them because of his lofty call. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm the anointed man of God, so I don't have to do those things. And this is what happens under false teachers. So Jesus uh, talked about it earlier in Matthew chapter 15, verse 5. When he's speaking to the Pharisees, you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you've made void the word of God, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 
In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So these Pharisees had come up with this super spiritual rule that, yeah, the, the Ten Commandments say honor your mother and father, but because we're so holy and righteous, we're giving some extra money to the stuff in the church and we got to make sure we don't, so therefore we don't have to give to our parents. And Jesus said, look at you. You're making laws that expose you're merely a hypocrite. You're using this lofty status to load burdens on your people so they have to give extra so you get to keep more. And so this is what it looks like when you sit under a false teacher. He's exempt because he's the anointed man of God. Therefore, his people are constantly exhausted from all they must do in order to be a good Christian. Thirdly, third mark of a hypocritical false teacher, they love to be honored more than others. They love to be honored more than others. Look at verse 5. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feast and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others. Phylacteries. Now, Josh read the text from Deuteronomy that said, bind, bind the word on your forehead, on your frontlets. So there was these little boxes that they literally would wear during times of prayer. And there was little uh, verses kind of on these small parchments rolled up and put into these things that they'd wear on their head. And, and, and it was, so it was actually a, a literal obedience to uh, Deuteronomy 6, that these phylacteries. But what, Paul highla- or what uh, Matthew highlights for us, what Jesus is highlighting as he gets at, is these, they're going to wear great big ones, or the fringes on their garments, which is fine. The fringes on the garments, we, again, we get from the text that's supposed to point us to God. But they're going to wear extra big ones. Why? Because they love to be seen by others. So the false teacher loves to be seen by others. He wants to get attention from others by what he wears. He wants to get attention from others by being set apart as special in a crowd. So when he shows up at the feast, it's like, yo, let me get the seat where everybody realizes I'm special. I, I, I want to, and when I'm in the crowd, I'm in the marketplace, make sure I get the inter- introduction, the proper introduction that displays I'm better than everybody else here. This is what a false teacher looks like. He loves to get attention by how he dresses. He loves to get attention by just how he's set apart from other people. And then he loves to get attention by his title. He refuses to be called only by his name. What he is called is overly important to him. Because, because, again, it's all about him. He loves to be seen by others, so he wants to make sure you and I are not the same. You want to know how? Look at my title. Look at my seat. Look at how I get greeted. You don't get greeted that way. You don't have that seat, and you don't have that title. You're not as good as me. This is the third mark of a false teacher, a hypocritical false teacher. He refuses to take heed to Jesus' warning in Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Fourthly, fourth mark of the hypocritical false teacher, their leadership model is in direct conflict with Jesus. So verse 8, so Jesus then turning to his, or saying to his disciples, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. So you're all sinners redeemed by the grace of God, which means you're all equal. So you were all jacked up, and you got saved by a righteous king. He brought you and adopted you into God's family. So there's a level playing field, just like with brothers and sisters. So you're all brothers, verse 9, and call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is the same leadership principle that Jesus taught repeatedly throughout this gospel. Greatness looks like humble service, not arrogant demands for honor in the kingdom of God. Greatness looks like humble service, not arrogant demands to be honored. This is what he's taught all throughout. So Matthew 18, 4, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So again, when baby Doris shows up, the baby Doris is not going to show up talking about, all right, I'm here, I'm ready to help. I'm going to get a job, I'm going to pay the bills, I'm going to contribute. It's going to show up with nothing but needs. Jesus says the greatest in the kingdom is like that, who understands I show up with nothing but needs. You, you want to be great in the kingdom? Understand your need and then just serve humbly. Matthew 20, 25 to 28, Jesus talking about the pagan rulers, those who aren't the people of God. Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever be great among you must be your servant. Whoever be first among you must be your slave. Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So for Jesus, greatness in the kingdom, as we've seen, he turns it completely upside down. In the world, you crush people, you climb to the top. In the kingdom, you get down and you wash dirty feet and serve. This, this is what the kingdom of God's leadership looks like. Now, just to be clear, I don't, want, I don't want you to swing the pendulum too far the other direction. So, Paul, you may say, wait a minute, you can't call anybody father? Like, what about your real dad? 
What about Paul? First Timothy, he says to Timothy, his true child in the faith. Second Timothy he says, my beloved child. To Titus, he says, my true child in a common faith. Then 1 Corinthians 4, 15, he says, I became your father through the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 5, 13, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So clearly, if Paul says, hey, look, he's calling his spiritual children children, They're, they could call him spiritually, call him father. And he says, hey, no, it, like esteem those highly who teach you the word and give you the word faithfully. So it's the, not the titles themselves Jesus is going after, but it's the amount of honor that, that these false teachers are demanding. Because what they want is the amount of honor that trumps the honor of the king. There's only one king. There's only one instructor. There's only one Christ. This is just a servant to teach you and point you to him. And so there's a way to honor the servant who's pointing you to the king in such a way that the king gets the glory, not the servant. And this is, this is what Christ is teaching. The kingdom of God, the leadership principle of the kingdom of God is upside down. So we are not to, be build, or we're not to build God's church on God's man. We build God's church on the God man, Christ himself. And so we don't build on my vision. We don't build on the elder's vision. We build on the vision of Christ as revealed in the text. And so the, the servants of the church, is, the best job is how do we faithfully do that? We got nothing new to offer. We got one message, Christ crucified and resurrected. I got nothing else for you. I don't have God on some kind of like special text conversation that you're not in on. <laughs> right? No, it's, we just serve. And so this is what the kingdom leaders are like. So what does this look like? If we celebrate the preacher or the church more than Christ, then we're in error. And so we pray and we try to rig up this service such that you leave thinking not Clint's a good preacher or Michael's a good preacher or Luke's a good preacher or Josh who's preaching or man, that music's great. We want you to leave saying Jesus is an unbelievable Savior. This is what the kingdom of God's like. Hey, I got, I got nothing for you except Christ, which means I have everything for you. He gave himself for you. He sends the Spirit to show you himself. So this is what leadership in the kingdom is like. Not angling to get praise and, and to get honor, but instead serving. How do we point others to the one who's worthy of honor? J.C. Ryle says like this, we must never allow them, the, the, the pastors, the leaders, we must never allow them to come between ourselves and Christ. The very best are not infallible. They are not priests who can atone for us. They are not mediators who can undertake to manage our soul's affairs with God. They are human just like us, needing the same cleansing blood and the same renewing spirit. They are set apart to a high and holy calling, but still, after all, only human. Let us never forget these things. Such causations are always useful. Human nature would always rather lean on a visible minister than an invisible Christ. So these are the four marks. They have a position of authority that should be honored. They wear their people out. They love to be honored more than others, especially in a crowd. And fourthly, their leadership models in direct conflict with the Lord. Freedom. May you just pray for your pastors and elders that we would work hard to make sure we don't, we don't fall into these temptations or errors. That we'd understand we're just servants, serving the king by serving you his word. Please pray that. May we as a church do all we can to honor our leaders, but do it in such a way that honors Christ the king. He's the only one ultimately worthy of our honor. Again, may we do everything we can to make people leave saying, what a savior. A friend, if you're visiting from another church and these marks describe your pastor or pastors, you need to leave that church. It's dangerous for your soul. So unashamedly, if this describes you, if these four marks would describe the pastor you sit under, you need to leave your church. It is dangerous because they're in danger in the very things now that, that Jesus is going to blast in these seven woes. If there's a false teacher, then these are the very dangers that Christ would warn us of. Secondly, the king rebukes hypocritical false teachers. Now, in this passage, we find the seven woes. Now, if you're looking at the old King James Version, you may notice, wait a minute, there's a, there's a verse missing, and there's eight woes in mine. <clears throat> why is that? I don't have a ton of time to get into all the nuances and why, but there's good reason to believe that, that the, I think it's the third woe, um, verse 14, I believe, or the second woe, verse 14, wasn't in the original manuscripts that the Holy Spirit inspired and was added later. And so therefore, for most of you, it's probably a footnote in, the, in your Bible down at the bottom where you can read it and look at it. But most scholars would say that wasn't in the original text. That's why it's not in there. So your, your Bible probably goes from verse 13 to 15. So if you're confused, don't worry, you're not a moron. It's actually missing. All right, so don't think you got a bad Bible. Go take it back. Hey, you guys messed something up. Um, it's, actually, it's, it's actually out of there. So this term, woe, it's an expression of both compassion and regret. So I want you to know, as you read these woes, I don't know what kind of face you put on Jesus as he's speaking to them. Some of you read them, that's right, Jesus, go get them. <laughs> go blast these stupid Pharisees. And that's how you're thinking he's looking. But no, there's tears in his eyes 
There is a strong, bold rebuke. It's a go to hell wrong issue. Like that's how intense he is, but he says it with, with compassion and tears. There's regret. We'll see that even as he, he laments later. But this is the same Jesus who looked at the crowds with compassion because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So as you picture Christ's face, you make sure you're picturing it correctly. Make sure you understand and read the text. Picture the text itself as you understand how Christ interacts. So look at these seven woes that show the horrendous guilt before God. First, what are they guilty of? What are these Pharisees guilty of? First, they're guilty of closing the door that they should open. Verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's face. You're supposed to be the people who's opening the door for the kingdom of God that people might enter. And he says, woe to you, you hypocrites. The very ones who are supposed to open the door so that sinners can come to life are the ones that's now slamming this door in people's face. The Pharisees have been creating a culture with the extra rules that only the elite get to get in. So create a bunch of legalists who think you've got to jump through all these hoops to make sure God can love you. You've got to be like the Pharisees or the scribes. Yet Jesus is the one, didn't he say he came for the sick? He said healthy people don't need a doctor, but the sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so the very ones who are supposed to be opening the door instead are slamming the door in the face of those who need Christ the most. And this harkens us back, even he says you guys won't enter. It harkens us back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 20. He says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So the scribes and Pharisees were so righteous in their own minds, and they were self-righteous, that they actually weren't righteous at all. And so Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you got to be more righteous than them to get into the kingdom. Because they don't get it. They actually think they're righteous on their own. They don't realize they need a Savior who is perfectly righteous, who would die in their place, resurrect, and bring them back to himself. So again, First, they're guilty of closing the door they should open. Second, they're guilty of caring more about stats than souls. These Pharisees are more, are, care more about stats than souls. Look at verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land. So you, you'll go around the moon and back. Why? To make a single proselyte or a convert. And when, a, when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. So he's saying, you, you, you got all kind of zeal. You'll go all over the world just to get one convert. Why? Because you don't, you don't care about their soul. You care about another notch in your belt that you got another convert, that your team has another one. And so you actually don't care anything about the souls of people. All you care is about the stats. So you care about how many rear ends are in seats, not actually the souls of the people in those rear ends. <laughs> and so you just, you're counting baptisms. You're counting how many people at services. You're counting money. And you're thinking, look how good we are. And Jesus is showing, like, you don't even care. Like, you're willing to go through all that zealous, but you're doing it because of you, not because of their souls. You care about stats, but not souls. This terrifies me in a culture that is convinced the bigger is better. Pragmatism is dominate and messing churches up all over the place. Because what's happened? Church numbers are going down. And so people say, well, do whatever it works to get them back. So let's turn the worship service into an entertainment service. As long as there's people in there, we feel like we're doing good. Jesus like, you don't get it. You're concerned more about your stats that you're reporting to your denominational heads than you actually do about the souls of the people sitting there. This is his great rebuke of these Pharisees in this moment. I would believe it's the great rebuke he would have for our church in this time. You don't do what works. We have one message that works. Christ crucified, dead, buried, resurrected on the third day. That's all we have. If that don't work, we have no hope. We're to be pitied more than all men. We don't suddenly say we'll change strategies and leave the gospel behind to do whatever works. Or we end up just like the Pharisees and getting the same rebuke Christ would give to them. As Christians, we have, again, we're, we're one-hit wonders, right? <laughs> we're the band who's only got one good song, the gospel. That's all we got. You bump into us, it's like, oh, I got that one hit, you know? All the rest of them are garbage, but this one, man, it's good. And that's all we have. We just we preach Christ and Him crucified. We're not in the entertainment industry. Entertainment doesn't save souls. Who cares how many people are in the seats if they're still dying and going to hell? Who cares? No, what we want is people to know God. We want them to be loved by God. We want them to know His love. The only way we can do that is through preaching the gospel and loving and serving folks. That will turn some away. It will, it will make some hate us and others love us. This is just the nature of gospel ministry. Read the Bible. This is what it looks like. Thirdly, they're guilty of missing the point of oaths. God is true. All right, so Jesus is going to critique here in this, uh, this woe, critique the ridiculous rules about oaths. All right, so he already told us back in the Sermon on the Mount 
hey, don't swear. You're Christians. You're disciples of me. Don't swear. Just tell the truth. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. You don't need to swear about all these things because it's like, no, if I swear by that, that means I'm really telling the truth. You're a Christian. Like God is true. We tell truth. That's just what we do. All right? Let your yes be yes. You're, he's already taught us that. So look at what he gets into. Woe to you blind guides. There's great irony in that, right? You're a blind guide. So you're a blind, but you're trying to lead somebody. You're trying to teach somebody to see something you yourself don't see. Woe to you blind guides who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. You blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? So he's like, does, does the gold in the temple, does the fact that it's in the temple make the gold special? Or does, is the temple special because the gold is there? You morons, what are you even talking about? That's just what he's saying. Like you're coming up with an oath by this or an oath by that, and you're making all these nuances, and it's ridiculous. You blind fools, what are you, like, what are you doing? Where do you get these rules? Which one makes the difference? And so he keeps going. And you say, 18, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that it's on the altar, he's bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by everything on it. So again, which is more important, a dead lamb on the altar or the altar that makes the offering of the dead lamb worship? That's what he's getting at. You're, you guys don't even make sense. Like, y'all not even studying your own rules. <laughs> These things are silly. Which one's more important? Which one gives worth? Verse 21. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Jesus says, look, if you swear by anything in the temple, do you not understand this is about worship? So if you swear anything in this, you're swearing by me, the one who sits on the throne of that temple. Christians tell truth because God is truth. So he's saying these, these rules that you've created to try to get around and make some people worse than others are just silly. You blind fools. All these oath laws prove Jesus' words about these leaders in Matthew 15, 14. You're blind gods, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. You're blind fools walking off a cliff, and you're taking all your followers with you. Next, he says you're guilty of missing the main point of the law, loving God and loving neighbor. So the next woes, you're, you're, milti, you're, you're guilty of missing the main point of the law. The law is to instruct you to love God, love neighbor. Look at verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So these guys, literally, we, got some, uh, we have some mint, uh, mint plant. Is it a plant? Mint plant in the backyard in Rachel's little raised bed garden thing. And, uh, and Nias loves it because he'll go pick off a piece of leaf and put it in his water, and he thinks he's the man because he's got mint water, right? So anyway, we've got this little mint in the backyard. So what, what, these, what these leaders were doing is like, look how holy we are. Not only do we tithe out of our income, we even tithe off that little mint income we have. So all these little herbs in our garden, we even tithe from that. You guys just don't understand how holy we are. You don't realize how righteous we are. There's nothing we don't. So this is what they're saying. But Jesus says, like, but, but you avoid and you miss justice and mercy and faithfulness. Like, what do you, verse 24, you blind God straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Now, what's he mean by this? Other than you're morons, because that's what he means. Straining out a gnat. So a gnat was unclean, right? If you, Jewish culture, you did anything unclean, touched anything unclean, you were unclean, you had to do all kinds of things to, to be purified and made clean. A gnat was unclean. Well, when you're drinking wine, there could be a gnat in there. And so they would go to all kind of effort to, to strain the wine to make sure there was no gnats in there so they didn't, they didn't drink anything unclean. And Jesus is like, you've got all these ridiculous laws, like you're tithing all this extra stuff, so you're worried about not, you know, not drinking the gnat, which is unclean, while you're swallowing a daggone camel, which is like the biggest animal that's unclean. And so you're out of your mind. So it's, it's, and, and we do this same stuff. Who cares if you've never missed church, if you don't actually love God and love people? I don't care how many straight Sundays you made it. Who cares? If you don't love God and love people, who cares? It's a little illustration for our day. What's he getting at? So the gnat and camel thing, it, it's like saying, hey, I floss my teeth really good while swimming in a sewer. It's like, well, I mean, I'm, you need to floss your teeth, but you should probably get out of the sewer you're, you're, you're in, in swimming. Like, who cares that you floss your teeth? Who cares that you've never cussed? Who cares that you've never done some of those things if you don't actually love God and love people? Who cares? It's foolish. If there's no just, justice, if there's no mercy, there's no faithfulness, who cares about all your little rules that you made up? This is what Jesus is getting at. 
The law is meant to instruct you to love God and love people. Do you have genuine affection for God? Do you have genuine affection for sinners who are far from God? If not, who cares what you're doing? This is what Jesus is getting at. Fifthly, woe five and six. I'm going to combine those two because they're very similar. Guilty of caring more about appearances than affections. So it's, I kind of just transitioned this there anyway. Guilty of caring more about appearances than affections. Look at verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside may also be clean. So he says, you're doing all kinds of religious deeds on the outside, but with the heart of a narcissist. Like you're doing all this religious stuff for yourself, for self-glory, for self-indulgence, for self-pride. You're doing all these good deeds, but all of them are bad deeds because you're doing them for the wrong reason. You're doing all this good stuff on the outside with a rotten heart on the inside. You're doing all this stuff to look good towards others, but why inside you're nasty. So stop worrying about the outside and do something to clean the inside. This is what Christ gets at. Verse 27, he keeps going. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So again, you look good and religious to others, but you are lifeless on the inside. You're dead. Like a whitewashed, empty tomb. Now, what's the significance culturally? Tombs, if, if anybody touched a tomb, you were considered unclean. If you touched a dead body, it was the worst kind of unclean. So what would happen in Jerusalem just before Passover, because everybody would come to town for Passover, they would whitewash the tombs to make them stand out so that people, because where the tombs were, they were kind of in these conspicuous places that you might just bump into it on the road. You might just walk into a tomb. So they whitewash them to make them clean so that you could see it. So Jesus says, you're like a whitewashed tomb. You might look good on the outside, but you're just a decaying, dead, rotten set of bones on the inside. You like present something pretty out here, but you're full of dead man's bones in your heart. You might know all kinds of doctrine, but have no devotion. You might do all kinds of deeds, but have no delight. Again, fair sake of false worship, outside, in, behavior conforming, sin management. Main focus, appearing godly to others. Authentic worship is inside out, heart transforming, sin slaying. Your main focus is glorifying God, enjoying Him forever. This is what Jesus is getting at. Friends, I fear that our churches in the Bible Belt are slam full of this. People who clean themselves up on the outside, while in, internally they're full of dead man's bones. They act like good Christians on the outside. But inside, they're rotting and have no life. No real walk with God. Never missed a Sunday in church. Never experienced the Lord Jesus. This is what Jesus is getting at. We clean up on the outside and present a lie every time we show up to church. I think a church is full of these people who think I'm presenting something good. You're lying every second you're in the church. <laughs> because you're presenting something you're not really. You look righteous on the outside, but inwardly you're dead. You appear like you have it all together, but you're rotten on the inside. You appear like you have it all together, but your marriage is falling apart. You have an addiction nobody knows about. You never have any desire to open up your Bible, but you act like you're a good Christian. You, actually, you act like you love Jesus, but you have no desire to be with him. You're all excited to go to heaven because streets are gold, not because God's there. You just want to go see family members in heaven. You could care less if God is there. God could not be there, and you'd still want to go to heaven. That's the essence of hypocrisy. I'm using God to get something else. I don't actually love him. I don't actually love God. I don't actually love people. You serve at church, but you never serve your neighbor. You appear righteous on the outside, but are filthy on the inside. This doesn't work. First, the inside of, of the cup needs to be clean. The heart must clean. Sixth, he says they're guilty of rejecting the king's word. Look at verse 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken a part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So they spent tons of time and all this money decorating the tombs of the prophets, okay? So what they're trying to do is say, look at all these dead prophets. Look how highly we think of them. You see all this cake we're putting into their tomb? You see how much decoration we did? Look how we love the prophets. Look how we love the prophets. If we would have been alive during our Father's Day and, and like those people who murdered the prophets, we wouldn't have done that. We wouldn't have murdered them. We love the prophets. Do you not see how we decorate their tombs? And Jesus says, you're just like those who murdered the prophets because you're rejecting the one whom the prophets pointed to right now. So you're saying I decorate the tombs of the prophets while you're rejecting the very one who the prophets talked about. So you're saying you love them, but you're rejecting their message. 
You're saying you love those men, but you're rejecting their message. Verse 31, thus you, you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. J.C. Ryle says their own conduct was a daily evidence that they liked dead saints better than living ones. The very men who pretended to honor dead prophets could see no beauty in a living Christ. And then notice just this general truth uh, from another, another commentator. Ask in Moses' time who were the good people. They will say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but not Moses. He should be stoned. Ask in Samuel's time who were the good people. They will, they will be Moses, Joshua, but not Samuel. Ask in the times of Christ who they were, and they'll be all the former prophets with Samuel, but not Christ and his apostles. So the Pharisee always likes the prophets of old, but he never likes the prophets of present who condemn them. And so this is what he's doing. So verse 32, he goes on, fill up then, just awful words, fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. Jesus demonstrates, literally in that statement, I will send you prophets. That's a massive statement because Jesus is saying, I am God. I'm going to send them. You're going to persecute them. You're going to beat them. You're going to flog them in the synagogues. You're going to kill them. You're going to crucify them, including even Christ himself. So he prophetically says that which is accomplished even in the book of Acts, fulfilled in the book of Acts, everything he says right here. So he predicts this. Go ahead and just the, the, all the blood is on your hands. Do what you're going to do, which is kill the people of God, is reject his word through his prophets. And he tells them why. Verse 35, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous, the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah. Uh, who knows if I said that right? Who you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. What's he do with that? First martyr in the Old Testament, Abel. Last uh, martyr in the Old Testament, Zechariah. Second Chronicles in the Hebrew Bible comes last. So he picks up those two and he says, everyone that died faithfully in the name of God, all of their blood is coming upon you for your rejection of all that they pointed to even now. Verse 36, truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So Jesus clearly displays rejection of his word given to his prophets and now the very rejection of the living word, the one whom the prophets pointed to. All the blood of all the martyrs will come upon those who now reject the one who the prophets pointed to. Friend, in the end, there's no secrets with God. The fact that you think you have secrets is one of those foolish lies you could believe. The fact that you think you can keep something secret from God. There's no secrets with him. He knows all things. And so to appear one way externally and to live another way internally does not fool him. So he's just gone through all these woes to show you. You think you're doing good out there. I look in there. So you have no secrets. It's a foolish lie to believe you do. You may be a hypocrite and you may have all of us fooled. You do not have God fooled. This is what Christ is saying. And this might seem mean and harsh, but it's only mean and harsh to the one who wants to keep hiding all the way to hell. It's not mean and harsh to call a hypocrite out for hypocrisy. That's actually love. Because we want you to have life. You're a phony. We want you to be true. You don't have real life. We want you to have real life. It'd be unloving to sit by idly and not tell you. Spurgeon says, he is not the most loving who speaks the smoothest words. True love often compels an honest man to say that which pains him far more than it affects his callous hearers. Thirdly, lastly, and, and very quickly, Jesus then after all this laments, uh, laments over the rebellious. So he closed our interaction by lamenting over the city that was special to him, Jerusalem. So he has this interaction. Now he's just going to lament over the whole thing. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. So he, he laments their rejection of his word and his care. He says, like a mother hen, like I would have gathered you safe under my wings. I want to protect you. I want to take care of you, I want to provide for you, care for you and love you, shelter you. But you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't have it. That's what he said. So he's lamenting. He's grieving. He's weeping. Like I, I wanted to, to nurture and protect you and you wouldn't have it. You were not willing. Friend, are you willing? The Christ who gathers you through his word even now, are you willing? Or you reject him. Secondly, notice their rejection of Christ leads to their destruction. Verse 38, see your house, the temple, the family of God. See your house is left to you desolate. Jerusalem will be ransacked in AD 70. Totally desolate, just as our king said it would. This was the judgment of God upon Israel for rejecting Christ the king. And so he says, I wanted to gather you and protect you. And in rejecting me, you went to your own destruction. This is true today. 
You can reject Christ all on to your own destruction. He would gather you like a mother hen to protect you and to reject him is to ask for his judgment. Thirdly, Christ abandons them to judgment and promises to return. Look at verse 39. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. These were the last words Jesus utters in the temple. He walks out and we'll have some other conversations outside the temple. This is the last words he says to the, temple, to the people in the temple, to Jerusalem. You will not see me again until that day when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So I conclude with just a few questions. Have you been living the life of a hypocrite? Pretty on the outside, dead on the inside. Are you exhausted from all kinds of rules you grew up with but could never keep? You're just worn out trying to obey the rules and know my heart is jacked up. I just can't do it. Are you trapped under the teaching of one who wears you out with all kind of extra biblical rules? Are you hiding who you really are in that addiction or in an affair? You're not really actually displaying who you really are. Do you long to live a single life rather than living a double life? The life of a hypocrite is exhausting. The double life is exhausting because you've got to figure out which one you are in certain places. So you see somebody out in public from church, like, oh, I've got to act like the church person now. It's exhausting. Are you tired of living the double life? Christ has sent his word to gather like a hen gathers her brood. Are you willing to gather into Christ even today? Let me give you a beautiful truth for hypocrites as we close. Beautiful truth for hypocrites. Christ is the king who carries your burdens. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. It's the exact opposite of all that the false teachers are doing. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Friends, the burden of hypocrisy is too heavy for you to bear. (laughs) Run from your sin and run to the one who says, come to me, all you weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. And how does Christ do that? We know how he does it. He throws on the burden of your sin on his back and then he's nailed to a cross. And his shoulders and his back are strong enough to carry that burden all the way into the grave. And so he takes the punishment of God upon him for the burdens that you should be carrying on your own. And then after three days, he raises and says, I left it in the grave. Those burdens have been deposited as far as east is from west. And so I've taken them from you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Repent from your sin. Run to me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me for I'm gentle, lowly in heart. What a great king. So the false teachers are those who load you up with burdens and wear you out. The teacher, the prophet, the king, the priest is the one who says, I'll take your burdens on my back. I'll die for them, and I will give you my record. I will give you perfect love for God that I have. I will give you my perfect love for neighbor. I will give them to your account. I will credit them to you so that God might receive you back as his own. This is the love of God. He died, and he promised that he'll come back, and he left the tomb empty. Friends, it's still empty, and he will come back, and he will come back and Dwell with those in the new heaven and new earth, those who came to him for rest. So hypocrite, come rest with the king today. Christian, come rest with the king today. Non-believer, repent of your sin. Run and rest in the king today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Christ, we thank you that while we were still yet hypocrites, you died for us. While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in so doing, you call us to turn away from a double life. You call us to turn away from hypocritical, false living and to run to you as life. Christ, you're the only one who's not a hypocrite. You're the only one who is true. And so we hope and rest in you. I pray now, God, for non-believers in the room that they would just be convicted in their heart that they need you. And they would see and hear your invitation to come find rest in you. Pray for Christians in the room that we would confess any categories of hypocrisy that you've convicted of today. We would turn away from that sin. We'd rest in you alone. We would hear, to tell us die, it is finished. And that would lead us to live a single life, not a double life. That we would flee from our sin and flee to you. And I pray for those who think they're Christians but have been hiding their whole life. Pray they come out of hiding to the king. I pray you give them rest. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.